help. Let's turn now to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 7. The prophecies of Ezekiel chapter 7 uh, took place in about 594 B.C. Uh, Jerusalem was conquered in its final overthrow uh, in about 588. So this is about six years before the final overthrow of Jerusalem and its ceasing to exist as a city for a period of 70 years. So the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Ezekiel the prophet, remember, he is in Babylon. He is prophesying to the Jews that had already been taken captive. At this same time, Jeremiah is prophesying to the Jews that are still in Jerusalem. Message is basically the same. The judgments of God are coming upon his people because they have forsaken God and they have turned to other gods. And that's the basic theme of the prophecies. It is the justifying of God in his judgment. God is fair. Even though the city is to be utterly destroyed, the people scattered, God is fair because there are reasons for this judgment, the reasons being they have turned their back on God. So the word of the Lord came to me saying, also thou son of man. Now he's been prophesying to the mountains how they're going to be desolate. So prophesy to the land. Thus saith the Lord to the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. There comes a time when things come to an end. While we are going through a particular epoch in history. It seems like things are just going to go on like this forever. But there comes an end. There comes that time when God says, that's it. It's all over. For a long period of time, evil has been prevailing in the land. There have been spotty revivals, short periods where there was a surface movement of the people towards God. But basically, at the core and at the heart, there's been this downward trend. If you would graph it, you could see that there was this gradual decline. And evil is becoming more entrenched and more powerful until you begin to think that there's no answer, there's no solution. Surely evil is going to ultimately triumph because uh, things are just going downhill. But there is coming an end to the evil reign. There is coming an end to the uh, licentious practices that are going on. And God is announcing here the end, the end of the land from the four corners of the land. Uh, the end has come. And now the end, he said, verse 3, has come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee and will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. An end of the period of God's grace, an end of the period of God's tolerance, of God's patience, of God's long-suffering, of God's mercy, 
And now the time has come for God to react and to respond against the evil that they have done, the abominations that they have committed. My eye, the Lord said, will not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense your ways upon you, and your abomination shall be in the midst of you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. As this judgment comes, you will know that I am the righteous, holy God, though patient, though merciful and long-suffering, yet a God of righteousness and judgment. And once a person has crossed that line, There is no pitying by God. You remember at the time of Noah, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. God had been striving with the people for years and years. It took Noah a hundred years to build that ark. While he was building the ark, he was preaching to the people of righteousness. But they were mocking him and laughing at him. And probably he was really the uh, subject a lot of, of a lot of jokes and all, uh, because here he is building that huge old boat out here in the desert, you know, and, and uh, talks about a flood. And uh, I can just hear the Johnny Carsons of that day. Uh, they had a field day with him, no doubt, uh, and his project. But the whole while he was preaching righteousness, how that they ought to turn to God in righteousness. And God gave them ample opportunity to do so. But there came that day there came that hour when Noah gathered his family and he went into that ark and it said, and God shut the door. He shut them into a place of safety, but at the same time, he shut the outside world to the judgment that was coming. No longer was there a place of refuge for them. The end had come. And the rain began. God's spirit wasn't striving anymore. No pity now. No mercy now. There was only that judgment of God that was coming. In the book of Hebrews, it speaks of how that those that despised Moses' law, if you spoke against the law of Moses, you spoke disrespectfully or, or disparagingly against the law of Moses. If there were two or three witnesses who would come and say, I heard him cursing the law of Moses. I heard him saying things against the law of Moses. If you had two or three witnesses that would, would come and, and bear witness against you, they'd put you to death. They'd take you outside the camp and they'd stone you. He that despised Moses' law was put to death by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse a punishment do you suppose the person is counted worthy? If Moses, despising Moses' laws would bring death, how much worse do you suppose the punishment for the person who trods underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ, who counts the covenant an unholy thing, who has done despite to this spirit of grace. For we know him who has said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then the writer adds, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands 
of a living God. Also in Hebrews, it talks about how shall we escape if we neglect this great salvation that has been offered to us by God? And the answer is there is no escape. But he said there is only that certain, fearful, looking forward to the fiery indignation of God's wrath whereby he will devour his adversaries. Now, God has been patient with the people. It's been years and years, hundreds of years, that God has put up with their evil. But they are on this downward slide, and, and there comes the end of it, the end of the grace, the end of the mercy. And now God will judge without pity. His eye will not spare. And as this judgment comes, they will know that Jehovah is God. Thus saith Jehovah God, an evil and only evil, behold, is come. Uh, Martin Luther translated that evil upon evil, behold, is come. In other words, the evil is just stacked upon evil. The people have gotten worse and worse. The Bible does prophesy concerning the last days that evil men shall wax worse and worse. The Bible said in the last days perilous times will come. It speaks of the conditions of these perilous times. One of the things is that wantonness. That is that boasting in evil and boasting of sin. It's not just sinning, but it is glorying or exulting, boasting in the evil. I thought it was interesting today with so many things being canceled as the result of the early morning earthquakes that there was a quick announcement that they would still go ahead with the gay pride parade in West Hollywood. That's what is known as wantonness, the open flaunting of your sin. I heard uh, on the news going home, I was trying to get an update on the earthquake, and they were uh, broadcasting one of the gay pride parades because they were all over the country, and these fellows were singing as they were going down the street when the saints go marching in. <laughs> but then they sort of put an interesting little twist on the end. It's, oh, Lord, I want to be in the number when the queers go marching in. That's wantonness. That is flaunting your evil. And, and the Lord says an end, an end has come. They have stacked evil upon evil. And, and though God is patient and though God is merciful and long-suffering, there is a limit. And the people had come to the limit they had exhausted their opportunities of grace and of mercy. And now the time of judgment has come. And God said, I'm not going to spare and I'm not going to have pity. But I will give every man real justice because they will get what they deserve. And when this happens, you will know that I am the Lord. For they have stacked evil upon evil. The morning, the day of God's judgment has come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time has come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. That sounding again of the mountains is a reference to the sound of joy at the time of harvest. 
as they are bringing in the vintage, the, the grapes and all, for the uh, harvest season. It was always a time of joy and rejoicing and partying. But you're not going to experience that again because I will shortly pour out my fury upon thee and accomplish my anger upon thee, and I will judge you according to your ways. Now, we don't want that. We don't want God to judge us according to our ways. We want God to judge us according to his mercy. Uh, David said, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And then he acknowledged his sin against the Lord, but he cried out for mercy. And God is merciful to those who will repent and turn from their sin and seek him. God will be gracious and God will be merciful. But to persist in your evil practices and in your evil way is only to court the judgment of God. And ultimately, that day will come when God will judge, and he will judge in absolute righteousness, which demands the punishment of your sin, which is death. And so again, God declares, my eye will not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense you you according to your ways and your abominations that are in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Now, God is many things. Uh, the name Jehovah is, is used uh, in compound forms to declare the, the various aspects of the character and nature of God. Uh, he is said to be Jehovah Rapha, the Lord thy God who heals thee. Jehovah Yireh, the one who provides for you. Uh, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord who is your peace. But now here he is the Lord that smiteth. When that day of judgment comes, those who have done despite to the spirit of grace, he becomes Jehovah the smiter, the one who smites. Not sparing, not having pity, but dealing with them according to their abominations. The abomination is always in the scriptures the setting up in your heart and in your life of another God. God alone is worthy and deserving of our praise and of our worship. And to worship other than God is an abomination. And so uh, it is the establishing of another God in your heart and in your life and the worshiping of that other God that constitutes an abomination. So he will judge them according to the abominations. We will talk about that a little bit in chapter 8. Behold the day, the morning has arrived, the day has come, behold it has come, the morning is gone forth. The rod has blossomed and pride has budded. It's, it's, you've come to the full fruit of the judgment now. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness, and none of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. You're going to uh, the people are going to be destroyed as well as your possessions are going to be stripped. Neither shall there be any wailing for them. Um, no one to pity, no one to mourn because they're going to be slain. The time has come, the day draws near. I, I think that God is, 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 is saying much the same today. The time has come. We have compounded evil upon evil. And, and the morning is breaking of this day of God's judgment and wrath, and it is coming upon the earth. Even the, the earthquake could be a precursor of, of what is yet to come. 
because I am convinced that God is going to begin to judge the earth and the inhabitants of this earth for their abominations, for the evil and the compounding of evil. So the time has come, the day is drawing near. Let not the buyer rejoice nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. Now, in those days, the preservation of the family property was one of the main concerns of a person. Uh, when they came into the land, each family was given a portion of the land. And that was more or less a sacred trust. This belongs to our family. The cultivation of it, the development of it, it's ours. And, and through the years, that maintaining of this family property was of vital importance. Now, there were times when because of financial stress or pressure, a person was forced to sell the family possession, the property. And when you were pressed or strapped financially and had to sell your property, that was always a time of, of sorrow, of mourning. And whenever you had the opportunity to buy property, that was a time of rejoicing. Oh, I get a chance to, you know, expand our property and our holdings. So selling was never a rejoicing. It wasn't, it's not like today when you put your house in and you say, all right, we sold it, you know, hooray. Uh, it wasn't that way uh, in those days. It was, it was the loss of, of something that was entrusted to you as a sacred trust uh, to maintain the family's possession. Uh, even today, if you g will go into the shops in the old city of Jerusalem, and if you start bargaining with these fellows too hard, you start pressing a, 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 for your price which is uh, too low, uh, they will throw up their hands in despair and they say, my grandfather owned this shop, my father owned this shop, and now if I would sell to you for that price, I would lose the family's inheritance, you know. And they get very dramatic over this thing of, you know, I've been entrusted with this shop that has been in the family for centuries, and you're trying to cause me to lose it, you know, by your driving for too uh, low a price. And, uh, and thus, uh, this keeping of the family's possessions was so important. Selling it was always a, a time of sorrow. Buying was always a time of rejoicing. Now, because of that, uh, the importance of keeping it in the family, they had that revisionary clause that we've talked about. In the contract, when you sold, you always had the opportunity to buy it back. Should your fortunes change and, and uh, in a specified period of time, uh, should you be able then to uh, purchase back the property, could you fulfill the requirements within the uh, deed of trust, then you could always buy the property back and it was maintained in the family. And even a, a second little revisionary clause, if you personally couldn't buy it back, then your brother could or your cousin could. The whole idea was keeping it in the family, not losing it for the family. But if you could not buy it back, if you could not fulfill the clause of the buyback, then it remained in the new ownership. Now, those who were selling their property and forced to sell their property in Jerusalem knew that it, as they went into captivity, they would not have the opportunity to buy it back. And thus there was real seller's kind of remorse, real sorrow over selling because they wouldn't be able and they knew they wouldn't be able to redeem the property when the time of redemption had come. And thus, as they were being taken captive, many of them were selling their property so that they have something and, and the buyers were going around. They had a field day because of all of the forced sales. But he said, 
that the day is drawing near that the buyer will not rejoice nor the seller mourn for wrath is upon all of the multitude. Everyone's going to lose it. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold. He's not going to be able to buy it back. Although they were yet alive, that is, though they were still living when the time came for the repurchase, they wouldn't be able to do it. For the vision is touching the whole multitude which shall not return. You're going into captivity and you're going to die in captivity. You're not going to live long enough to return to the land. Neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. For they have blown the trumpet to call the troops to battle, to call the men to their positions, to defend the city of Jerusalem, that they might all make ready. But none goes to the battle. For my wrath is upon the multitude thereof. The sword is without the city, and the pestilence and the famine are within the city. He that is in the field will die by the sword, and he that is in the city will be devoured by the famine and the pestilence. There will be no place to hide, no safety. Those that are out in the field will be killed by the sword. Those that seek refuge within the city will die even a worse death by famine and by the plague. Those that do escape shall escape, and they will be on the mountains like doves, mourning as a dove, that, that sad uh, sort of a mournful cry of the dove upon the mountains and upon the valleys, all of them mourning everyone for his iniquity. It's a terrible thing to ultimately face the penalty for your sin, and at that point, come to a place of, of recognition, I am in this because I sinned. I am going through this pain and this suffering because I didn't listen to God. And it's always a, a tragic thing. It's an interesting thing how that just a split second kind of decision, wrong decision, that's made in a split second of time can cost you a lifetime of suffering and misery. I have a friend that I went to high school with. He was a next door neighbor. And he was driving his car along a two-way, two-lane highway, and there was a car in front of him that was going slowly. He was quickly overtaking the car, and they were on a curve, and he had to determine whether or not to try and pass the car, take his chances, or to break and to pull up behind the car and wait until they got to a place where you had sufficient vision. And, and as you are approaching, you're making all of the computations at the uh, closing speed that you're coming on. When is that crisis moment when I'm going to have to either break and pull behind him or go for it, you know? And, and as you're making, you're coming and, and you're, you're contemplating, you're wanting, you know, brake or, you know, accelerator, you know, and, and you're going, going, and then finally he came to that point, I'll go for it. Pulled out in a head-on collision. His spinal cord was severed and he was paralyzed from the neck down. And it was a tragic thing. as I would visit him, and he would be in that wheelchair and head back and could just talk, had his full mental faculties, but had no physical faculties, to realize that that split-second wrong decision is going to cost him a lifetime of invalidism. 
Now, just that quick, the wrong decision cost. And I can imagine that as the years went by and he was in this paralyzed condition, that he went over and over and over and over in his mind that whole decision process. I would imagine that he could see his, that, himself approaching that car and, and determining, what shall I do, you know, shall I break, shall I pass? And, and I'm sure that that decision haunted him. Haunted him. You know, you, you, you can't change the past. You can't go back and, and relive it. You can't redo it. My dad and brother made a wrong decision to fly up from San Diego in my brother's plane in, in this horrible storm. And they crashed and were killed at Pendleton. And you think, and, and I, I, I was tormented over that. Why didn't I say, get a motel, stay in San Diego, fly up tomorrow? Why, why, why did I say that? If I'd only, if, you know. And, and you're tormented by that. Because the wrong decision can't be reversed. You can't go back and change it. And I think of a person who is consigned to hell and to that place of punishment, how it must haunt them over and over and over the folly of deciding not to receive Jesus Christ. They probably, in their mind, go through every service where they sat there and said no. Every invitation that they heard, that they sort of gripped the pew and said, no, I won't this time. And it's there to torment and to haunt the, the, the tragedy of making a wrong decision. And here, the people had made the wrong decision. And now they are going to go into captivity and you're not going to return. You're going to remain a captive. You're not going to come back to the land. For you will not return to that which is sold, though you're still alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude which shall not return, and neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. At that time, your iniquity will not be a joy to you. Those pleasures will be long forgotten, and only the misery of your folly remains. They have blown the trumpet to make ready, but none goes to battle. For my wrath, the Lord said, is upon the multitude. The sword is without, pestilence within, and they that escape will be mourning, and that horrible, tragic mourning over the folly. All of their hands will be feeble, all of their knees will be weak as water. They, they will be so devastated by the famine that when the Babylonians finally make the breach in the wall and pour into the city, they will be too weak to even stand up and defend themselves. They've been emaciated by the horrible famine that uh, they have experienced. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth. The uh, sackcloth was always used for mourning. It was a sign of mourning. Uh, in fact, they had several signs of mourning. One was sackcloth. Uh, the other was ashes on their head. And the other was... Uh, shaving their hair uh, at death. Even to the present day, they uh, still will not let a razor come to their head. And many of the Orthodox will shave their heads when a family member dies. It's a sign of mourning. And so these signs of mourning, girding themselves or clothing themselves with sackcloth, uh, and horror shall cover them. Shame shall be upon all their faces, the ashes that they, they wipe upon their faces. And uh, then... Uh, the baldness upon their heads as they have shaved their heads in mourning for the death. 
They shall cast their silver in the streets. Their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. And so their gold, will, silver, will be worthless. It won't be able to purchase anything for them, much less their salvation. It's been a stumbling block to them. As for the beauty of his ornament, he is set in majesty, but they made the images of their abominations and the detestable things therein. Therefore have I set it far from them. Um, these idols, these images that they were worshiping, I will give it into the hands of the strangers, all of their gold, their silver, the little silver idols and gold idols. And of course, they made uh, solid gold and solid silver idols, images of their abominations. And uh, strangers will take them. The wicked of the earth will receive it as a spoil, and they will pollute it. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my secret place. That is the holy of holies. The enemy will come into this place that only the high priest could enter, and that once a year, one day in the year. And uh, it will be polluted by their enemies. Actually, uh, later on, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, slaughtered a pig in the Holy of Holies to desecrate uh, and to pollute uh, that holy place. My face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my secret place, for the robbers shall enter into it, and they will defile it. Make a chain. <laughs> and so the Lord told Ezekiel, make a chain and, and bind yourself up with this chain. For the land is full of bloody crimes, the city is full of violence. Uh, the end uh, of, of, the, of the nation came as, as violence, riots, crime, horrible bloody crimes and violence in the streets. Wherefore, the Lord said, I will bring the worst of the heathen and they shall possess their houses. I will also make the pomp of the strong to cease and the holy places to be defiled. Destruction comes, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor, and then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priests and the council of the ancients. They will finally begin to seek after uh, the prophet, the priest, and all, but it will be too late. The die will have been cast, and uh, it's too late now. And the king will mourn, and the prince will be clothed with desolation. The hands of the people of the land will be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, and according to what they deserve will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So it came to pass in chapter 8, in the sixth year, the sixth month. Now, uh, the prophecies of Ezekiel began in the fifth year of the captivity of King Jehoiachin. And he speaks of it in uh, verse 2. It was in the fifth day of the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's uh, captivity. So this is a year later that he is prophesying now in the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, as he sat in his house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, and the hand of Jehovah God fell upon me there. So he's sitting in his house with several of the elders from Judah, all of them captives, when suddenly the hand of the Lord came upon the prophet Ezekiel. And he had this vision. He saw what was like the appeared to be fire. It was like the likeness of fire, just this flame of fire. And uh, from the loins downward uh, and uh, upward, uh, it was the appearance of brightness and it was the color of amber. So suddenly there was this bright vision, looked like fire, 
And uh, then there was sort of the form of a hand that came out of the fire and took him by the lock of his head, by uh, his ponytail, and uh, the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. And he brought me by vision of God back to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looks towards the north. This would be the inner gate of the temple looking toward the north. Where was the throne of the image of jealousy? There in the temple they had set up idols of the pagan gods and goddesses. And right there in the door of the temple was this image, this idol, the likeness of Ashtoreth, there in the temple of God. And, and so he was brought by the Spirit in a vision where he saw the temple and he saw the, this abominable uh, abomination, uh, this, this idol that uh, they had erected there in the temple. It was the throne of the image of jealousy. God said, I am a jealous God. You are to have no other gods before me. You're not to make any graven images, to bow down to them and to worship them. And uh, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God. And so here is the image that was provoking the jealousy of God as they were bowing down and worshiping this image of this pagan goddess there in the temple. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plains, that is, by the river Kabar, uh, that glory of the Lord that he describes in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. And then the Lord said to me, Son of man, Lift up your eyes now to the way toward the north. Look towards the north. And so he said, I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar was this image of jealousy in the entry. Right there in the entry of the gate to the altar of God was this idol, this image, the image of jealousy. He said, Furthermore unto me, son of man, do you see what they're doing? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel is committing here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. Do you see what's happening? you see what the people are doing? Right here in my house, the things that are going on, should I not leave the sanctuary, but turn yet again, and I will show you even greater abominations. This isn't the worst of it. And so he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole there in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, I saw a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. And so I went in and I saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable beast, uh, abominable be beast, um, in the carvings, in uh, and around the world, of these beast-like creatures that you see carved in the temples in India. Uh, you see carved on the buildings of ancient Rome, uh, the gargoyles and, and these various ugly-faced creatures, uh, usually with the tongue hanging out. Uh, actually, uh, that tongue hanging out was a sign of demon possession. Uh, but here they were, these same kind of images that uh, look like animals, these creeping things uh, and these horrible, grotesque-looking 
forms of, of animals. Uh, they were there on the walls, uh, along with the idols of the house of Israel. And they were portrayed on all these walls. There were all of these drawings uh, there on the walls. Uh, the um, idols were of Ashtoreth were, were pornographic. They had exaggerated female forms. And uh, they were designed for the same purpose that pornography is designed today to arouse a person sexually. And uh, here they were portrayed on the walls of this room that he came into when he had dug through the hole in the wall. And there stood before them the 70 men who were the ancients of the house of Israel. That is the older men, those who were leaders, the elders of the house of Israel. You remember that uh, at the time of Moses, when the job of trying to give judgment to all the people was too great, there was a line of people from morning till evening uh, to talk to Moses that he might give judgment. And, and his father-in-law said, Moses, man, this is going to kill you. You know, all day long, all you do every day, all day long, is just sit there while this whole line of people are waiting to talk to you and all. And, and you've, got to, you've got to delegate some responsibility. You need to, to get hold of some men. And so the Lord commanded Moses to choose 70 men, the elders of Israel, bring them into the tabernacle. God would put his spirit upon them. And they would judge then over the people. And uh, if a case came to them that they couldn't handle, then they would come to Moses more or less as uh, the Supreme Court. Moses would go to God, get the judgment, and pass it on to the 70 elders. And so they were the judges. They were the elders or the judges of the land of Israel. Now, uh, here were these 70 of the ancients. And there stood with them Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan, and every man had a censer in his hand. The censer uh, was uh, the little incense censer that the priest offered unto the Lord, uh, the incense unto the Lord. And so a thick cloud of incense went up. But this was not incense unto the Lord. In the pagan festivals, there was also that burning of incense. You remember in the hippie era, as the hippies were uh, involved in just about everything that they could get involved in, uh, including a lot of the Hindu-type religions where there's a lot of burning of incense uh, to cover the horrible smells that you get in India. Uh, so the hippies uh, got into the incense trip, uh, along with many of the other trips that they were in. And uh, uh, so these men are holding these censers of, of incense, and the place is filled with this thick cloud of incense. You remember the, those uh, hippie stores that all you go in and had that smell of incense? Laguna Beach, you know, walk by and you'd smell the incense floating out with the smell of the uh, marijuana and the rest of the stuff uh, that was coming out of the places. Uh, then he said unto me, Son of man, have you seen what these elders, the judges, the, the rulers do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery. In other words, this is what's going on in the minds. Ezekiel, I brought you into the mind. What you see is what they are thinking, the imagery of their mind. It's an awesome thing to realize that God knows your thoughts. He knows everything that you think. The Bible says there is nothing hidden from him, but everything is naked and open unto him with whom we have to do. And, and a lot of times people have their own little uh, secret chamber that they think no one knows, no one sees, no one knows what's going on in my thoughts, you know, but God does. And you see what every man is doing in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord doesn't see us, and the Lord has forsaken the earth. 
And so with that idea that God doesn't see, God doesn't know, uh, they were giving themselves over to the evil. They were not checking evil. They were not restraining the evil. But in their minds, they were going over and their minds were polluted with this evil because they thought, well, God doesn't see and God has forsaken the earth. But he said unto me, turn yet again and you will see even greater abominations that they do. So he brought me to the gate or the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a god of the Babylonians, the ancient Babylonians. The worship of Tammuz went back almost, uh, well, it went back to the time of shortly after the flood when Shem, the son of Noah, settled in the Babylonian plain. Uh, you remember the next incident that is recorded in the Bible is uh, there in Babylon, the building of the towers in Babylon unto heaven uh, that they might communi communicate uh, with the spirit beings and uh, God bringing the confusion of tongues there at Babel. This ancient Babylonian religion was Satan's counterfeit to God's redemptive program through Jesus Christ. There was a woman who was named Simiramas, and she bore a son whom she named Tammuz. Supposedly, Simiramas was a virgin, and thus it was purported that Tammuz was born of a virgin, Simiramis. And so the mother and child were worshipped. Simiramis was called the Queen of Heaven. She was always portrayed in the art with a halo about her head. According to the legend, she had a, another child whose name was Ashtart. And Tammuz fell in love with, or was seduced by Ashtart, who was his sister, but she became his wife. But she betrayed him. And according to the legend, she, or the stories, this Babylonian religion, uh, Incidentally, Tammuz was born at the winter solstice, December 25th, and thus his birthday was celebrated by the ancient Babylonians with um, pigs, with um, fires and so forth. The, the Yule log, it all goes back to the Babylonian customs. Uh, it was... Um, uh, well, to go on with the story, Tammuz was out in the woods. He was hunting, and he was killed by a wild boar. And his spirit descended into uh, Hades, the netherworld. And Ashtart uh, was so grieved over his death and being in the netherworld that she went down into the nether world to join him and uh, to mourn and to weep for him. And uh, through her weeping and intercession, he was released from this underworld and was resurrected. And they celebrated his resurrection by calling it, because Ashtart had uh, interceded and, and had brought the resurrection, uh, they celebrated at the spring solstice what they called Ashtart, 
which was uh, in honor of Ashtart, who uh, went into the underworld and, and uh, by her weeping and all and grief, uh, he was given a reprieve and allowed to come back to the earth. And uh, thus the earth began to spring forth with flowers and all, and they worshiped at the spring solstice uh, th what they called Ashtart, or what we call Easter. Easter comes from the word Ashtart. Uh, celebrating the resurrection of Tammuz, Satan's counterfeit. And uh, this was a part of the Babylonian religion. It became a part of the religion in Judah. It was the abomination that God detested. The women weeping for Tammuz. Here it is, right in the, the temple. Here are these women. And, and that was the custom every year during the uh, winter time when, uh, and if, according to the stories, Tammuz had to spend six months in hell and six months on the earth. And uh, while he was in hell, the earth was uh, dark, you know, I mean, it was, the, the plants all died and, and uh, the, the, the sun was, was waning and the days were getting shorter and the winter time was setting in. But then Ashtart was celebrated in the spring when everything began to bud again and the earth began to uh, come to life. And thus uh, Tammuz then was here during this time of budding and all. And uh, the uh, summer, the, the summer solstice was actually the worship of Tammuz uh, during the summer solstice. And even in the Jewish calendar, their month of July is named Tammuz, uh, which uh, means summer and is uh, a carryover from that ancient Babylonian cult. When Constantine, the emperor of Rome, made Christianity a state religion, in order to get the support of all of the people, he incorporated into the church many of the pagan practices that the Romans had borrowed from the Babylonians and that the Greeks had borrowed. You have your Adonis and, um, and all the same, the same stories. They, they are translated into different cultures and the same idea of uh, six months in the netherworld and six months on the earth, just given different names. Uh, and so he incorporated into the church these pagan Babylonian festivals. And so rather than celebrating on December 25th the uh, birth of Tammuz, we say we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And that's why we celebrate it December 25th. And uh, we celebrate uh, and we call it Easter, which is directly from Ashtart, uh, the spring solstice, uh, the resurrection to life. And, uh, and these things became incorporated into the church. I am not yet convinced, or do I have an opinion of what God thinks of the celebration of these days? It's so deeply ingrained now in us by tradition that I sometimes wonder what does God think of us as a church celebrating these particular days. And I'm not certain. I, I do confess that I have certain problems with it. Now, on the other hand, I know that in Christ, all things are lawful for me. And that at Christmas, I know I'm not thinking of Tammuz, <laughs> but I'm thinking of Jesus Christ and I'm honoring him. But you know, 
As I look at the way the world is worshiping Christmas, it's becoming more pagan all the time. It started out as a pagan holiday, and it is ending as a pagan holiday. There's very little thought of Jesus at Christmas time. The major emphasis is on commercialism, on the gift buying. The attention has been diverted from Jesus to Santa Claus, and he becomes the central character at Christmas, the one that the children are most interested in. Uh, rather than God's gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ, it's, you know, the latest G.I. Joe uh, that has the attention of your children. And, and it has become rather pagan, and I think that as Christians we need to evaluate uh, our celebration of the day. And the same is true for Easter. But I'll leave that with you to ponder. And uh, <laughs> I've been pondering it for a long time. So he said to me, have you seen this? It's almost like incredible. Do you, can you believe this? You know, can you believe this is actually happening here in the temple? These women weeping for Tammuz? Turn again. I'll show you even worse, greater abomination than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Now this is the place where the priest would go. And behold the door at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar. He saw about 25 men, which represent the priesthood, the 24 courses, plus the high priest. And they had their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Here they are in this inner court, the place of the priest, but their backs are, toward, are against the Holy of Holies. And their faces are toward the east. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. So here were the priests involved in sun worship right in the temple of God. Then he said unto me, Have you seen this, or can you believe this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they are committing here? Can I just ignore this? Is it a light thing? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Now, uh, the, the idea there is uh, they stick their nose up at God. The idea is that of snubbing God. Have you ever heard a person who was stuck up that talks about uh, their nose is stuck up in the air? They are snubbing. They walk past you and they put their nose up in the air like they don't see you. And God is saying they are, they are trying to snub me. They are worshiping the sun. They are worshiping Tammuz. They're worshiping Ashtoreth, and they're snubbing me. Therefore, I will also deal in my fury. My eye will not spare. Again, repeating, I'm not going to have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet Will I not hear them? They've gone over the brink. They have gone beyond the limits. I'm not going to spare. I'm not going to pity. Even though they cry loudly in my ear, I won't hear it. They've gone too far. Where is that point where a person goes over the line? where you go too far, 
where God says, that's it. How close are you to that line? God has been patient. God has been merciful. But they ignored the mercies of God. They ignored the warnings of God. There is a time we know not when, a line we know not where, that marks the destiny of men twixt sorrow and despair. There is a line, though unseen by man, once that it is crossed, even God himself in all of his love has sworn that all is lost. They had gone over that line. They went too far. God said, is it a light thing that they keep snubbing me, that they won't listen to me? I will judge them. My fury will come upon them. I will not pity. I will not spare. And though they cry unto me with a loud voice, I won't hear. They've gone too far. As a servant of Jesus Christ, as a minister of God, I must warn you that you can go too far. You can cross the line twixt sorrow and despair or hope and despair. You can go too far and God will shut the door and say, okay, that's it. You've snubbed me for the last time. I've given you the last call. I've given you the last invitation. And you've marked your destiny. And it's established. I pray that that is not the case of any of you tonight. The unpardonable sin, that place where you've gone over too far and God says, okay, that's it. And you enter into the hopeless despair. Even though you would cry, God wouldn't hear. You've snubbed him once too often. Don't let that be the case. If God is speaking to your heart tonight, if the Spirit of God is moving upon your heart this evening, if there is still that conviction of sin, that awareness that I haven't been living for God as I should, I know I am doing things that are not pleasing to God, and the Spirit of God is still dealing with you, rejoice! Rejoice! that God is still striving with your heart. And surely take advantage of it and seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near, lest the wicked days come when there will be no more opportunity. I would encourage you to go back to the prayer room. Some of the elders of the church will be back there. They'll be happy to pray with you tonight. This could be God's final call to you. You don't know. It may be that you've snubbed him so many times that God says, okay, once more, I'll give you the opportunity. An end, an end, God said. It's over. They've gone too far. And if you continue, that day will come when God will save you, an end. That's it. To Jeremiah, he said, don't pray anymore for their good. If you do, I won't hear you. Let them alone. They're given over to their idols. It's serious business because it's the difference between the love of God and the fury of God that you will experience for eternity. Something to seriously contemplate. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you've been merciful to us. 
and that you have forgiven us and cleansed us from our sin and from our idolatry. Thank you, Lord, for washing us and making us pure. Thank you, Lord, for your patience with which you dealt with us. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you put up with as you were dealing with us. Thank you, Lord, for your stubborn love that did not let us go. Lord, we rejoice in that hope of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through Jesus our Lord. But in the same token, Lord, we realize that there are those here tonight that are still caught up in abominable idolatry. Their lives are still ruled by other gods or goddesses. They are still bowing their knees to the pleasures and to the things of this world. And they've snubbed you over and over. Oh, Lord, as you deal with them tonight, may they respond. May this be the night that they come from darkness into light, from the power of Satan into the kingdom of God, in Jesus' name we ask it, Father. Amen. So we stand. If you don't feel anything tonight, then I would be very worried. You think, well, so what? It means it could possibly mean that you've already gone over the line, which would be a tragic thing indeed. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord guide and keep you in his love. May the Lord bless and give you a wonderful week. May his hand be upon you to guard, to guide, to preserve. In Jesus' name. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom